hello, everyone. I'm Time Senior Health Correspondent Alice Park. And I have to say, one of the things I love about being at Time is the breadth of our mission. So this summit, I think, is a perfect example of that. And to prove it to you, we are going to go from music to medicine. <laughs> And we're going to go from a breakthrough artist, like Megan Thee Stallion, to game-changing scientists, like Dr. <laughs> Dr. Deborah Persaud and Dr. David Sinclair. Both of you have published really important papers this year, in the past year, um, that really made us question what's possible and, and what's impossible, right? And changed our ideas of what's impossible. So we're going to get to that. Uh, and we're thrilled to have both of you here to talk about what it takes to make medical miracles happen. But before we do that, really quick show of hands here. How many people think it is possible to reverse aging? David, I think you have your work cut out for you. <laughs> <laughs> and how many people think it's possible to cure HIV? A few more, a few more. <laughs> All right, Deborah, let's start with you. HIV was discovered in 1981, more than 40 years ago. We've got some great drug therapies now, but people have to take multiple pills and have to take them for the rest of their lives. Um, we still don't have a vaccine. Millions of people are still getting infected every day. Why is it so hard to find a cure or, or an effective treatment for HIV? Yeah. So, so first, Alice, I want to thank you for you know, featuring HIV cure research, because that's what this is about. Um, the reason it's challenging, in which I've spent the last 30 years studying, is um, that HIV, when you get infected, it establishes itself in the immune cells. These immune cells contain the virus integrated into your genetic material. The virus remains quiet, and so your immune system and the drugs that we currently have cannot eliminate those cells or clear those cells from your body. And so when you stop the antiviral drugs, the virus just comes back. And we know that it happens in almost everyone. Even if you've been treated for 30 years, you stop your meds, medications within two to four weeks in a child, in an adult, the virus comes right back. But we've had few cases where the virus didn't come back and that gave us the clue that it's possible to put this infection in remission and eventually a cure. I'm gonna make a couple of points for the audience. It's really important to know these numbers. 38 million people worldwide are living with HIV. 1.7 million children are living with HIV. New infections continue, even though we know how to prevent infections. There's no vaccine because the virus escapes our immune response. It evolves as your immune system tries to keep it in check. And that's the challenge of developing an HIV vaccine. But there's hope for new therapies, immunotherapies, to control the virus when treatment is stopped. And that's the mission of our agenda for remission and cure. And David, as you saw from the audience, I think a lot of people are very skeptical about perhaps if we told them your, your book title, which is Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you mean by that and the fact that perhaps your road is a, is a bit harder. You know, at least with viral infections, we've had vaccines against different viruses and we've had treatments. With aging, it's just been assumed that it's an inevitable part of living. So, Tell us a little bit about how your thinking about aging is changing, hopefully, the way we th are going to be thinking about aging. Uh, yeah, so thanks for having me here. Um, so the, the way I see aging is that it's, it's the root cause of most disease and disability on the planet. We call the end product of aging in different organs, we call them diseases. But really what's happening is the body has this universal process that's leading to these diseases. And we've been slapping Band-Aids on the end product of aging and not addressing the root cause. And so in the future, we'll look back at today and say, why didn't we actually address what was the problem? Uh, we tend to think of aging because it's natural, something that we should just accept. But 100 years ago, cancer and heart disease were natural. You couldn't do much about it. Um, we're now at a turning point the way we were in the 1970s with cancer and HIV in the 80s uh, and 90s, where uh, we have a much better understanding of what is causing aging. Um, our paper that we published just this year is about identifying a universal cause of aging in all of our tissues. Um, 
And this process turns out to be rather simple to reverse, it turns out. Um, it's probably going to be easier to, to reverse aging than it is to cure HIV. Uh, and I've heard written, it here first. <laughs> uh, once you know the trick, it's not that hard. Students in my lab are reversing aging in cells and animals every, every week now. Um, and the trick was to identify that there's information in the body that can be reset. It, our bodies are like a computer, and we can reset the software to be young again. We're not in humans yet, but uh, we're getting close. And, and this paper was in mice where we could actually, now that we think we understand what's going on in the body, it's software corruption. The software is called the epigenome, the systems that read the DNA. The corruption of that system uh, leads to diseases. And we could show in mice that by corrupting that software, we have tricks to do that, we could drive aging in a mouse forwards and backwards at will, back and forth as fast or as slow as we wanted to. How confident are you that, I mean, obviously mice are not men, <laughs> that you will see or are that that same process is also going on in people? Mm -hmm. Well, we first discovered the process, as you know, when we first met, uh, in yeast cells, think, you know, the microorganism that makes bread and beer. Um, so we're going back now 25 years. So we've been doing this for a while. And this paper that we just published uh, in January in Cell was the culmination of 64 scientists around the world, 13 years of work. So we've been doing this for a while. And so we actually we, we spun out a company from my lab, uh, Life Biosciences, that has been doing studies to get us to age reversal in humans. Uh, the mouse studies have been going on for many years. We were able to cure blindness in mice, glaucoma, old age, nerve crush. Uh, curing blindness turns out not to be that difficult once you know how to reset aging. And when you reset aging in the tissues, they rejuvenate, they can heal. We can even reverse aging in a, a mouse's brain and recover the ability to learn. And even now we're discovering recover lost memories from before. But you're, you want to know how close are we to that? Well, we just uh, two days ago released uh, publicly, spoke publicly that we've reversed aging in the eyes of non-human primates, our closest cousins. And so it looks like this universal process of age resetting in the body uh, is conserved from yeast to mice to primates. Now, if it doesn't work in us, then we've done something wrong. But I'm pretty optimistic that it should work at least in the eye. And then the future would be, where do we go from there? And we're looking at the brain and hearing, and then lower below the neck. We're going to come back to that, because I know everyone wants to hear more about it. <laughs> um, and, but Deborah, you know, equally important, your paper this year, um, when you emailed me about it, you said that this was really going to open up the possibility, um, the access that people might have to this potential cure. Tell us a little bit about the patient and why you feel it's so important. Yeah, Alice. So, so what Alice is talking about, and first I want to say that it was a collaborative effort, a team effort, a large team effort. It was a result of a clinical trial we established in 2012 to rep, this is how old this um, protocol was um, open, to really replicate the first case of cure reported in 2009 the Berlin patient, known as the Berlin patient. And so the reason this case is... So just really quick, this was an yes. HIV patient who had cancer right. and therefore needed a bone marrow transplant. Yes, thank you, right. right. So it's okay. the first uh, proof of principle that if you used specialized cells, stem cells, to transplant an individual living with HIV because they needed a transplant for some other illness, such as cancer, that if you use these specialized cells that are called CCR5 Delta 32, which about 1% of whites have this um, genetic mutation that makes their immune cells resistant to infection with HIV. And so the Berlin's patient, Timothy Brown, his physician, specifically looked for these CCR5 Delta 32 cells to transplant him. And the field went for about 10 years before we could replicate that finding. And finally, in 2019, there was a second patient, a London patient, who also got these specialized CCR5 Delta 32 cells. Now, since then, this past year, there have been two cases. Our patient, the New York woman, and it's the first woman to have achieved this remission, and we're hoping possibly cure of HIV through stem cell transplantation. But what was different, it's, and I'm a pediatrician, it's cord blood cells. So these are CCR5 Delta 32 cells from the cord blood of a baby. And why is this important? Most of the individuals infected with HIV are non-whites. This is an epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa. 
So you it would be very hard to find a match to transplant a non-white individuals. But by using cord blood, they're more per permissive and tolerant, so you don't need that very stringent match, genetic match, to be able to transplant someone. And so this woman, a middle-aged woman of mixed race, developed leukemia, like the Berlin patient, and was transplanted. And at the time of the report, had been off her drugs. And that's how we can tell if someone is in remission on the way to cure. A problem in the field, we have to stop antiretroviral drugs. And she was off for 18 months. We tested 75 million CD4 cells, specialized cells that the virus hides in and could not detect HIV replicating in those cells. And so we believe she's in remission and likely cured of HIV from this special transplantation procedure. <laughs> And when we talk about curing HIV, are there different levels of cure? I've, I've heard the expression functional cure and you know, people warning us that it isn't a cure cure yeah. in the sense that you know, we've completely eliminated the virus. Yes, because as you were talking about the virus, right. it tends to be, it tends it, to hide. Right. right, and that's why we're afraid to say cure. We say possible, likely, probable, and we are not sure when to really declare someone's cured. But we like to think about this like cancer. You know, you're put in remission from cancer, and then if you survive long enough and your cancer doesn't come back, you're cured of HIV. It's a real challenge to do this, but there are many new strategies now in terms of trying to take advantage of the immune system. So giving now immunotherapies, not just antiretroviral drugs to prevent the virus from multiplying, but try to embolden our immune system or the immune system of a child, a newborn, an adult, an 80-year-old with immune therapies to really keep the virus in check. So to get to your point of functional cure, we actually, with the case of the Mississippi baby, had labeled that case as functional cure because the baby had been off therapy for, actually was 27 months at the time of the report. Um, and so we thought that was probably a cure, but we learned from that case very disappointingly, but 27 months is unprecedented to be off therapy the virus was hidden and came back in that child. And so the field, because we're dealing with communities, individuals are trying to stay away from giving a false hope of cure. And so there's a lot of um, changes in the field in terms of terminology. But by functional cure, I think it would be really accurate to think about you've cleared the virus sufficiently, but your immune system is now functional to be able to keep the virus in check, that if it reawakens, you have immune, set, immune effector function to clear those cells from which the virus is coming out of. That's a remarkable advancement, I think. And, and David, with respect to your work this year, um, it, it requires gene therapy. And I'm sure many people would like to know, yes, there is still this, the next step to kind of prove that it works in people. But do you see the possibility of having your therapy in the form of a pill or a vaccine or a shot or something that doesn't require a procedure like gene therapy? Uh, right, so the way it'll be delivered uh, in the first patient in about one and a half to two years from now will be the gene therapy in the eye. That's the first art. And My, why the eye? The eye, well, we chose that because there's already gene therapies for the eye and it'll be easier to get that on the market. And right now, there's not much you can do for glaucoma or macular degeneration. We th I thought that would be a good place to start. Um, and we can do whole body rejuvenation at a later date. Um, but to your point, I have a, a little uh, mighty lab at Harvard, um, wonderful students there. And uh, as soon as we saw that the gene therapy was working in those mice, we got to work to find chemicals, molecules, natural and synthetic, that would replace the gene therapy. Because ultimately, we want to make this as cheap as a coffee. Uh, and uh, we have molecules that are rejuvenating cells, reversing aging. Uh, we're writing up um, our first publication on this. And so I, I see a time in the future where it will be possible to uh, have an injection or even take a pill for a few months and be rejuvenated by over a decade. So you and I have known each other for many years, and I have to say, you really have not changed at all. So I'm going to get... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think he's aged at all. So I want to get some personal perspective from both of you. Um, 
tell us what you do, because we've heard a lot in the news, I think, recently about you know, some extreme measures people are going to stay young and reverse aging. Um, what do you personally do based on your research to you know, try to extend your lifespan and stay as young as you can? How long have we got? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I wrote about it in my book. If We'll run out of time if I go through all of it. It's um, on page 304 of Lifespan. But because uh, often I don't get to the, to the whole list. But there, there's a long list. Um, my father has been on a similar protocol. He's chosen to do what I do. and Actually, he does it better than I do. He's now 84, almost 84. Perfect health. Can, he can drive a car without glasses. So it gives you an idea of what might be possible for the population. Um, it's eat well. Um, so I'm, I'm now mostly plant-based. I don't drink alcohol anymore. Inspired by my partner, Serena Poon, who's a, a wellness expert, longevity expert, and a nutritionist and a chef. So that was a big change. And I think that might be partly why I, I look better than I used to. Uh, also, uh, and she's a wonderful person, that helps. Um, but also supplements, uh, which I've talked about a lot. Online, people sell a variety of supplements. I'm usually not involved. Uh, but there's NMN, which is, or is an NAD booster, which we've, we've shown now in mice, we haven't published, uh, can extend the lifespan of the And you've animals. studied this for many years. Yeah, it came out of finding genes that control aging, and then this NAD molecule boosts those. It's a, it's a mimic of exercise and, and fasting. So exercise and fasting, I also uh, think, are good ideas uh, with, you know, with supervision. You want to measure yourself. You can't just do this blind. You don't drive a car without a dashboard. Um, so you can do this with a doctor, take blood tests, measure things on your ring and on your watch. Uh, but optimize. You just want to change one thing, see how it goes. Um, and for that reason, biochemical tests are saying that for the last decade, I've been getting younger every year. Uh, and so thank you for, for saying that. But really, the, the point is yeah, that it's not that, <laughs> it's not that difficult, actually. Really, you know, I'm, I'm pretty lazy. I don't like exercise. I don't like going on in cold showers and saunas and all that stuff. But I do try to eat well every day. I try not to eat three full, three, three full meals every day. I try to pack it into dinner if I can. Um, and just by doing all of those things that doctors typically recommend, and I recommend, you, it's been shown that you can extend your lifespan on average by 15 years. And that's just the easy stuff. Wow, diet and exercise. Yeah, and have a good, have a good partner. Yeah. Uh, don't smoke, stress, don't, don't right? drink like, too much. <laughs> reduce stress, meditate if you're worried. Try to get good sleep. Those simple things we all know, we just it's hard to do, but it really makes a massive difference. And every day we're aging, we can now measure that uh, with DNA tests. And when you do, do that, even children are aging. We talked about HIV uh, positive uh, children are aging rapidly. So even what you do in childhood echoes for decades later. So it's never too early to start living well. It's also never too late, we're finding. And Deborah, for people who are diagnosed with HIV um, and find themselves HIV positive, what should they prioritize to ensure for what we have today and what they can look forward to you know, in the future from researchers like yourself, what should they prioritize to ensure that they live you know, the longest and healthiest life that they can? So, so the greatest advance in our field, and you know well, Alice, because David Ho was Time Magazine Man of the Year, was really the advent or the discovery that combination antiretroviral drugs really can keep HIV at bay. You take your meds every day and you can contain the virus to undetectable levels in blood plasma. We know now from 30 years in this field that if you take an, an adult actually living with HIV has a normal life expectancy. Children can live into the third and fourth decades, but their life expectancy has not been fully restored but there's hope with newer treatments. And so I think the key message is to take your medications. But first, prevention is key. We know how to prevent acquisition of HIV. And as we embark on this cure agenda, we still have to stress prevent infections. We know how to do that. And as a pediatrician, I want to say the prevention space was pioneered by women signing up during pregnancy and enrolling their infants in drugs, we didn't know the safety profile because the disease was devastating. It was a death sentence to women and their infants. And so prevention is part of what we need to focus on. But if you are infected, you actually can live a normal lifespan 
with eating well, exercise, and taking your medications, and perhaps prevent aging. <laughs> I, I could keep going, but our time, <laughs> unfortunately, is up, and lunch is next. So um, given the theme of today's summit, last question for both of you. Um, time is celebrating its 100th year. And I could ask you where you think aging, how long we'll be living in 100 years, and where, you know, whether we'll have a cure for HIV in 100 years. But I know you guys are both working so fast that that's too far ahead. So yeah. let's talk 10 years. David, how, how far are we going to be with finding ways to slow or even reverse aging in a decade? Well, things are going so fast. My head is spinning. Just a few years ago, it was ludicrous to talk about age reversal. And now it's in the leading scientific magazines. There's billions of dollars being invested by companies and countries. It's, as, it's going to be as big as AI in the next few years. Um, I think that within 10 years, uh, we'll have, not we, but the field, hopefully I'll be involved, uh, will have shown that it's possible to reverse aging and treat a disease. Doctors will have these medicines. They can try them not just in the eye, but in other ailments, bringing back memories, hopefully treating, curing Alzheimer's, those kind of diseases. I think in 10 years, it'll be possible for most people to have a discussion with their doctor about resetting their body 10, 20 years, depends on how long you take the pills for. Um, and what we're finding also is you can reset the body of a mouse at least multiple times. So perhaps 10, let's say 20 years from now, we'll be able to go back every 10 years for a, for a reset and, uh, and stay young for not just decades, but even longer than that. So some of us can see the, the 22nd century. Right. <laughs> Something to look forward to. <laughs> And Deborah, big question for you. Will we have cured HIV in 10 years? So I'm going to answer that with um, the lens of a pediatrician and a focus on children. And we, we know from 10 years ago, from the case of the Mississippi baby, that we know if you treat newborns and neonates early, very early in the first few days of life, that we can really limit and restrict these reservoirs. If you treat early, around two to three months of age, by 10 years of age, the reservoirs are really reduced. And I do believe in the next 10 years, we'll have identified immunotherapies to keep HIV at bay. Now, I don't think we, that would be considered a cure, but it would be considered remission and control of HIV, that a child does not have to face taking medications every day, which is a problem. And the stigma of living with HIV and disclosing your status through having to take your medications every day. So I'm very hopeful for that. Good. So are we. <laughs> well, David and Deborah, thank you both for joining us at the Time 100 Summit and giving us this glimpse into the future of medicine. Thanks, thank you. It. Thank you.